You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Saturday and Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord. Right here on KLRN Radio and the Spark Radio Network. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at R-A-H-A-R-D-I-N dot com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. Each of my programs are being saved so that you can listen to them at any time. There's just four simple steps to find the past programs. Go to www.spreaker.com. That's S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. Enter my name, Richard Harden, in the search box in the top center of the home page. Click on the brown icon, which has the Bible, two candlesticks, and a cross in the background. A list of my programs will come up. You're listening to God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden. Richard will guide you through the Bible and help you find God's purpose for your life. Now here's teacher and author Richard Harden. Welcome to God's Pure Word of Faith. I'm Richard Harden, and again, I want to thank the Lord and the management of KLRN Radio for this great opportunity to share God's Word with you today. Today I want to continue to share with you about some of the uh, problems we have in, in seeking to serve the Lord and seeking to find His pure word of faith. Uh, there's three main areas that we need to be concerned about. You know, God has sent His love to us. He's, he's come to us even even before we were born, you know, in our mother's womb and, and, and like that. And, and uh, Helping us, you know, to be born and, and, and to come alive in this earth and everything. Jesus, years and years ago, suffered and went to death on the cross, you know, uh, that we might be forgiven of our sins and we might, you know, receive him, you know, after he resurrected and came back, you know, to receive his resurrection spirit, you know, into our hearts to actually transform us in into children of God. We're not just, you know, the uh, human creatures that we were born of by our mothers and fathers, but we have the opportunity then to receive His Spirit, His living Spirit, into our hearts. To, and He comes in and creates in us a new heart, a new life. We become a child of God. And we're, what Jesus says in John chapter 3, we're born again. We're born of the Spirit into the body of Christ. And He's prepared that way for us for years it's been you know available to people now uh, our problem is with with Jesus you know and, and sending his spirit to us in different ways um, through his mercy his, his loving spirit directly to us and on us like it says in Isaiah 59 uh, he puts his spirit on the people and, um, it's mercy uh, 
protecting us and, and you know around us and, and like this you know in, in our daily lives keeping us from having automobile wrecks or things like this you know just uh, his mercy on us well his grace and the work of his spirit in our heart anytime you see or hear the word grace you should think of the work of God's spirit in our heart because uh, that is that is you know the difference between grace and mercy mercy is God's love one way love to all of mankind he loves all of us and, and you know he's always time trying to draw us closer to him and in his direction like this but grace is then when we accept his spirit we accept his uh, words to us his guidance or whatever you know his spirit when he manifests himself to us in what we call a message or he speaks to us or something faith comes by hearing hearing more of God but when we hear God then we we recognize it's God speaking to us and we receive what he shares into our heart see his words are alive and they're living Jesus said in John 6 63 my words are spirit and they are life so we receive his words and his his life into our heart for whatever it is he's speaking to us and manifesting to us well then we call that the work of grace but the work of grace is always associated with working in the heart of mankind but the way he gets into our heart is by our invitation when he had you know uh, manifest himself to us we have to personally invite him to come in especially at salvation when when he teaches us we get old enough in our you know physical lives and uh, God teaches us that we're a sinner that we're separated in our heart from him and we're all born, you know, without any of his spirit in our heart. So we're born in total sin. That's what sin is, you know, separation of the heart from God. And so when he teaches us then about that separation and that we need to invite him to come in, that Jesus is our answer, we need to turn to Jesus and ask forgiveness of our sins, invite him to come in. And then when we then willingly respond to that information and invite him to come in, that then is when his spirit enters us and we receive the new heart, new life. It talked about in Ezekiel 36, 26, God speaking through the prophet said he was going to make a new covenant. The Old Testament people didn't have this covenant we have today. They just received forgiveness when they turned to the Lord and everything, and they got their sins covered. But we get so much more than that, and that's why the devil is just so active today in trying to confuse grace, trying to confuse what it means when people talk about it and everything because grace then is a work of the spirit that comes into our heart when we turn to the Lord and ask his forgiveness of sins and invite him to come in and that work of the spirit then is, is a total result of our choice to invite him to come in because he wants to come into everybody's heart but like in Hebrews 4 2 it says for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them but the word preaching them did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. See, mixing it with faith is that we respond positively to God's uh, message to us about our sin, about Jesus being the answer. And when we then say, Lord, please forgive me, come into my heart. See, that then is when his living words, his spirit comes into our heart, creates in us a new heart, a new life, and we become a child of God. In Ezekiel 36, 26, God says, and A new heart also will I give you, a new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh, give you a heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit in you. And he said, that's going to be, you know, the new covenant, the new relationship. But in Isaiah 59, 21, he told the people, he said, My covenant with you is that my spirit is upon you, and my words are in your mouth. And then in the... Psalms 25:10 it says, uh, "Mercy and truth, mercy, God's spirit on us, like it said in Isaiah, and truth, His words to us, are all the ways of the Lord to those that obey His covenants and testimonies." See, that's all they had in the Old Testament, and so God didn't like that covenant. It says in Hebrews chapter 8 that God wanted to change that, and uh, and make that better covenant with us. He wanted a closer relationship. He wanted closer fellowship. And that then is when he, you know, uh, spoke through the prophet uh, Ezekiel. It says, Ezekiel 36, 26, a new heart also I give you. See, in the Old Testament, they didn't get the new heart. If you look in uh, 
Job 33, 27. It says that God searches you know, around and looks for mankind or any man that's seeking him. And let me find that real quick here. To, God looks upon men, and if any say, I have sinned, see, confess their sin, and perverted that which is right. You know, they recognize their sin is a perversion of, of right, um, correctness, you know, and the way should be living everything. I have sinned and perverted that which was right, and it profit me not. And they recognize it's worthless. It's hurt them. It hadn't done them any good. He says, when God looks upon men, they say, I've sinned and perverted that which is right, and it profit me not. God will deliver his soul from going to the pit, and his life shall see the light. Yes, see, but that was their way in the Old Testament, you know, of turning to God. But God's response to them was just he forgave their sins, and uh for a period of time, and he covered their sins between those sacrifices and everything that they offered. Now, see, that's the difference in the great covenant we have with God now. He creates in us a new heart when we turn to him as forgiveness. He creates a new heart. He gives a, you know, puts his spirit in us. And he just, we become a part of his family. A new heart also will give you. A new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart of your flesh, give you a heart of flesh, and put my spirit in you. Now, see, all of that activity that he does in us when we ask forgiveness is now what we call the work of grace. But it's a result of our faith, our accepting his words into our heart. See, so for by grace, all that activity and that work in our heart that God performs in us and adopts us into his family, we become a child of God, that's all a part of grace that's why it's so wonderful so great because now we are children of God Galatians 4 6 says and because your sons God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying Abba Father wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son if a son then heir of God through Christ joint heir with Jesus and that is what the devil is working so hard to confuse people about that he doesn't want them to see clearly this great new covenant God has with us of, of Christ in us our hope of glory and Christ in us that we are now children of God and people out there listening today you know all around the world can become children of God today if they'll just turn to God and ask forgiveness and invite him to come into their heart and the devil doesn't want that message to get out clearly so he does everything he can to confuse well first faith so we don't know what faith is uh, but see faith is just our, when we hear from God our acceptance and obedience to his word um, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. But it's not just an intellectual hearing in your head. Well, Psalms 119 now, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to God's word. And see, while I go to that scripture I read in Hebrews where it says, you know, that, that the gospel preached to them did not profit him, not being mixed with faith. See, just hearing and knowing God's word is not faith. Hearing and knowing is God's word. You know, you can know the truth and believe it. That's not faith. Faith comes when you choose to accept and receive his word in agreement into your heart. Because if you reject and drag your feet, that's unbelief. It's unbelief and rebellion and dragging your feet and saying, well, I'll do it later or something like this. In the book of Samuel, first, first Samuel 15, verse, uh, verses 22 and 23. Now, God sent this prophet Samuel to, to the rebellious King Saul that had been rebelling against God's word and uh, hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices and obeying the voice of the Lord behold to obey see God's word to obey him is better than sacrifices you know the king had been offering sacrifices but God didn't like that because he had, the priests were supposed to do it that wasn't the kingly you know, um, activity that was supposed to be done. He was disobeying by doing it himself. He said, Does the Lord have great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. To obey his word, to receive his word into your heart, that you're a sinner, and invite the Spirit of Christ into your heart, and to, you know, be born into the family of God. To obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. 
Now it says, as you drag your feet, thinking about, well, maybe I'll do this. Maybe I should wait till I get out of college. Maybe I should do this, whatever. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. That's because, see, witchcraft is going to get a person totally out of God's will. Witchcraft is total, you know, sin and total rebellion and all this. Well, every time I think of witchcraft, I think now that they even call that a religion in the federal government and everything. And in prisons, they have services where they provide services for people who claim to be witches and everything. But see, it says here, for rebellion is a sin of witchcraft. That's just dragging your feet. Even those of us as Christians now, when God speaks to us to, to do something like uh, go down and speak to a neighbor, to help a neighbor, to teach a class, to uh, lead a devotional, something like this. When we drag our feet, see, that's how terrible that is, that we're, we're dragging our feet and saying, well, God, maybe I don't want to do that. Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I'm too old. Maybe, you know, we're, when we start analyzing what God asks us to do and everything and then start, you know, uh, beating around the bush and dragging our feet. It says here, rebellion, it says a sin of witchcraft and stubbornness. Now, stubbornness, dragging your feet, iniquity and idolatry. See, so it, it is terrible, you know, to to hear God's word. See, it's a heart problem. When we hear God's word and know it's God's word and then we reject or drag our feet or something, that is just uh, terrible in God's eyes because he, he has done so much in, in bringing his love to us. And, and Jesus did so much in his perfect walk of faith and in his, you know, sacrifice on the cross, the sprinkling of his blood on the, um, as he was dying on the cross and everything. Like this for us. And then we drag our feet when he turns to us and everything. That's not right. But see, the devil tries to get us to do that and everything. And misunderstand what faith is. It's just as simply we need to accept and obey God's word. Like the children of Israel, when they came up to the promised land, they all knew it was God's will to cross over, but they rejected to unbelief. It says in Hebrews chapter 3, verse, verses 12 through 19, because of an evil heart of unbelief and departing from living God. And that's the way we are too, even as Christians. We drag our feet. You know, it's almost like we're trying to decide ourselves if we think that what God is speaking to us or what he wants us to do. If it's really worthy that we should do that, you know. Should we really do that or not? You know, we evaluate it. Uh, maybe I'm too old. Maybe, you know, I don't have the time. Or, you know, I'd like to relax more, something like this. You know, when we start evaluating God's will to us and everything, we're setting ourselves up, you know, uh, against him. And that's terrible. Anyways, it's as witchcraft, he says. That's the reason I've gotten my title of the message for the last couple of days. Lies and falsehoods and untruth and witchcraft because it, it, it's as witchcraft when, when we drag our feet and, and hold back in doing what God wants us to do. And, now, and the devil's going to do everything he can to try to make us feel like, well, maybe somebody else needs to do that they're better qualified or something like this but if God calls you or me to do something we're qualified now we may not be you know as good in performing right at first and everything but we got to have a first time and he'll help us and teach us and guide us and lead us we got to trust him and he'll do that but now the devil is always trying to confuse especially faith and grace in fact he's, he's got the data for you know uh, uh, it just it is so confusing because they have so many different denominations preaching and teaching different things. Uh, and the, the copies of Bibles here, uh, let me see, I've got a little bit of statistics for you here uh, to show you in the Old Testament 67 times that the uh, word grace or gracious or something like this was used. It should have been favor, mercy, uh, pleasantness, kindness, and things like this. Uh, there was no grace in the Old Testament, see. The Old Testament covenant says in Isaiah 59, 21, God says, My spirit on you and my words in your mouth. And then in Psalms 25, 10, it says mercy and truth. Mercy, his spirit on us, and truth, his words to to us or to them in the Old Testament to all of those that obey his covenants and testimonies. See, that's the relationship they had in the Old Testament. But yet, in all these copies of the Bible and everything, and, you know, King James and others like that, the 
devil somehow or another got the word grace to be used 67 times like that and, and it shouldn't have been now in the New Testament 130 times when the word grace or any form of it was used every time it's used in the New Testament if you look up in the concordance and something like this it is talking about the divine influence the influence of the Spirit of God on the heart of mankind the Spirit working in us, in our hearts, creating in us a new heart or helping us to grow closer to the Lord, grow closer to being like Him. And see, grace is a New Testament word. It was miscopied into the Old Testament. But because of that, though, in all those times it was miscopied in the Old Testament, so many people teach and everything that there was grace in the Old Testament. Um, a Bible answer man across our nation every night and everything like that. When he talks about grace and salvation, he says the people of the Old Testament were saved the same way we are. No, they weren't. You heard me read out of Job while ago, you know, how they were, you know, saved and everything. That God forgives their sins, but he they don't get the born again experience of Christ coming into their heart and us becoming a child of God and that work of grace that brings us into the family of God. We're like engrafted, it says in the book of James in chapter 1. It says we're engrafted into the family of God. We become a child of God. The people of the Old Testament didn't. They were referred to as children a lot of times, but it wasn't children like, you know, in, in Galatians 4 6 where it says, And because your sons got to sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore you no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ, joint heir with Jesus. See, that's what we receive, that great grace. Uh, and, and it comes as because we invite his spirit of his living words, his life into us. Uh, and, and he's got people running around now today, preachers, ministers, they'll say grace is God's unmerited, unearned favor. You know, like this. That grace is not associated with favor. That's the Old Testament or the uh, relationship between God and, and His mercy to us and everything. His favor to people, external to their heart. Grace is always a work of the Spirit in the heart. And like in uh, Romans chapter two, verse four, it says, "Despises out the riches of His goodness and forbearance, long suffering, not knowing that the goodness, see His favor, the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance." God blesses lost people to draw them to repentance. And he blesses us Christians when we stray away from him and go in the wrong direction. He blesses us, you know, like that, to draw us back. See, that's his unmerited favor is, is drawing people back to him and everything. But that's not grace. Grace is the work of the Spirit in a person's heart. Every time you think of the word grace, think of Christ in our heart, our hope of glory. Was it Colossians one twenty seven? Christ in us, our hope of glory, and uh, we're a new creature. We're ambassadors for Christ. We're to speak His word faithfully. Now, see, so unmerited favor is external to our hearts. It's it's drawing us, trying to you know get us to respond in the right direction. Lost people to come to Him for salvation, but for those of us that are Christians, that He's trying to draw us in to teach that class, draw us to become a, you know a leading devotionals and things like this see that's a unmerited favor Romans chapter 2 verse 4 now his unmerited favor is so fantastic because see all of God's love is the same we don't have different God doesn't have different kinds of love that he sends to us mercy truth it's like when you hook your house up to the city water main you get water main line coming into your house and then the pipes in your house divided up to the kitchen, divided up, you know, to the um, external, you know, outside faucets and everything where you can water the grass. And then you have some water that goes into the bathrooms and like this and everything. But see, it's the same water coming from the main source. It's just it comes out at different places where you need it for different type operations in your house. And that's the way it is with God's love. God is one spirit. Ephesians 4 says one spirit, one faith, like this. So when uh, we talk about mercy, that's that's God's love. We talk about grace, that's God's love. But we call it grace because it's his love working in our heart. Mercy is God's love to us, like he says in Isaiah 59, 21, my love upon them. And in uh, 
Psalms 25:10 says, "Mercy and truth are all the ways of the Lord to those that obey His testimony and covenant." See, so for all the people of the Old Testament, they had God's love on them and His word to them. We have His love on us, mercy. We have His love in His word, His living word, Christ to us. But we also have the work of grace, the work of His love in our heart. Now, so. Anyway, when you think of grace, Christ in us, or Christ in people, when you think of mercy, it's God's love on people, or to people. When you think of faith, it's we've got to make the choice to accept and receive His Word in agreement with His Word, or we reject to unbelief. And that's the difference in faith and unbelief. If we receive God's Word in our heart, we're receiving it to faith. That's why it says, for by grace are you saved through faith. Because when we receive God's word of our sin and that, that our need for Jesus, when we receive that into our heart, those living words in now perform a work in our heart that we call the work of grace. It's just a different uh, function of God's love in us. Okay, now, so, and the devil wants that to stay confused as much as he can and everything like that. Because they have all these different uh, copies of the Bible out that have, you know, 60-something times, you know, the word grace or something used in the Old Testament. And, and people will talk about Noah found grace in the eyes of God. No, Noah found mercy in the eyes of God. Mo Noah found favor in the eyes of God. Not grace. Jesus was the only person in the Old Testament period before the day of Pentecost that had the Spirit of God in his heart. And it says he, Jesus came with grace and truth. Grace and truth came by Jesus. And he came in the fullness of grace and truth. See, so, but from the day of Pentecost on, when uh, the resurrected Spirit of Christ, the living Word, came back on the day of Pentecost and entered the people's lives, that started the new covenant relationship that we have today with Christ in us, our hope of glory. Now, and that is so important, everything, because. Uh, the devil's got so many different things like that, like, a, you know, grace is God's unmerited favor. Now, see, his unmerited favor is so fantastic. He spared my life I don't know how many times. I, I can count four or five times just I was within instance of dying and being killed. And it was just like, you know, in the old movies and everything where the Lone Ranger would ride in at the last second and save the people or something like that or Superman would or something. And it happened to me so many times, and I knew then, even in my life then, I knew it was God doing it. But he spared me so many times, and I was that close to going off into eternity of separation from God and in the lake of fire, and didn't even know it. I thought I was a Christian in those days, and I found out later I wasn't. But I tell you what, and, and that's why I do not want any of you listening this morning to that. If you cannot remember the changed heart talked about in Ezekiel, a new heart also will give you. A new spirit will up within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of your face, give you heart of faith, and put my spirit in you. If you can't recognize, and see, you should be able to recognize, because if you see yourself full of sin and full of lust and full of all these things in your heart, and you turn to God and say, Oh, Lord, please forgive me. Take this away from me. Create in me the new heart. Put your love in me. You think you won't know it when he does it. You've asked him personally to do it. And but he'll do it right then when you're praying and asking him. I've heard so many people say, oh, such a burden has been lifted. Man, I love to hear people say that when they pray and uh, ask the Lord to you know, and come into their heart and life. Because I know that something has taken place in them that only could be Christ coming into their heart. That's such a joyful response when I hear people pray like that, invite him to come in, and they say, oh, such a burden has been lifted. There is a burden. It's just like your heart is just smothered and with, you know, like a dark clouds or something like this over you. And then when he clears that up and puts his ray of sunlight, his light in your heart and everything like that. Now, if you have not received that changed heart and know that you now are a child of God, put that on top of your list, please. Pray right now. Start praying now. And don't stop until you know for sure that you're a child of God. He wants you to know, and he'll let you know. But, we, see, the problem is we've got to come to him with all our heart. And sometimes people try to hang on to things and say, Well, I want to stay in this little, 
you know, crooked deal I'm in, or I, I want to sow some more wild oats. I want to, you know, have some fun before I get out of college and things like this. See, so you try to hang on to things like that. You got to seek Him with all your heart and say, Lord, I don't care. I'm, I'm turning my life to You. Please come into my heart and create in me the new heart, the new life. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard Monday through Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Saturday and Sunday mornings at 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern. Join him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord, right here on KLRN Radio and the Spark Radio Network. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. Each of my programs are being saved so that you can listen to them at any time. There's just four simple steps to find the past programs. Go to www.spreaker.com. That's S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R dot com. Enter my name, Richard Harden, in the search box in the top center of the home page. Click on the brown icon, which has the Bible, two candlesticks, and a cross in the background. A list of my programs will come up. You're listening to God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden. Richard will guide you through the Bible and help you find God's purpose for your life. Now here's teacher and author Richard Harden. You know, I've been sharing for the last couple of days now about um, errors being taught in, in about faith and grace and mercy and, and different things like this that men, great men in our society that are our leaders and everything, and I kind of hate to say this, but their their confusion in, in these areas. But the reason I pointed out, not to criticize them, I don't want to criticize them because uh, so many of them have done so many great things in their life, you know, and, and a lot of people have been saved in their ministries, but I'm just pointing out this because the clearer we can be when we share about faith, what faith is, acceptance and obedience to God's Word. And, you know, that's, faith is not something you can hey, place your faith here and place your faith there and like this. No, when, when God speaks to you, like to teach a class, you either have to accept and, and teach this class or reject it. You don't have anything that, that you can place here and place there. You, see, it doesn't make sense. You don't have faith in you that you can just run around place in place. Uh, like in a couple of messages too before, um, in Romans 12, 3, where the Apostle Paul says there, he was speaking to Christians now, in Romans 12, is a gift of the Spirit. He says, all men have a uh, measure of faith. God has given to all men a measure of faith. He was talking to Christians. That's a gift of the Spirit. Because in Second Thessalonians 3, 2, the Apostle Paul says, pray for us that we be delivered from evil and wicked men in whom is no faith. See, he wasn't contradicting himself. See, evil and wicked men have not accepted and received God's word to faith. See, he's saying, pray for us, we'll be delivered from those people. Jesus says to the disciples in Mark 4.40, uh, why is it you have no faith? And then the first time the word faith is used in the scriptures, God said in Deuteronomy 32.20, in fact, he evidently in, uh, invented the word since it's the first time it was used. He says, my children so forward and everything. He said, they're a forward generation in whom is no faith. See, so these these false teachings like this, uh, even though they're not intentional or something, 
mislead people and it allows the devil then to come in with that uh, confusion or something and, and turn people away like place your faith you know it sounds so great now to say place your faith in Christ but see that's total error you don't place your faith in anything you accept God's word into your heart to faith see you, you can't place your faith here and there I see the correct possible way of using that would be place your confidence, place your trust. Like Jehoshaphat, he was surrounded by three armies. Uh, he was, he feared. He set himself to seek the Lord. This is in Second Chronicles chapter 20. And then he prayed and sought the Lord. And God said, it's my battle, not yours. You just go sit out the mar march out the gate, sing and praise, and sit out there and watch a victory. Now see, here's the difference in trust and faith. Would you trust uh, through a priest this well, this, this Sunday when you go to church, a lot of people you know, supposedly have words from God in Pentecostal circles and everything. But if but if, uh, if one stood up in your church this next Sunday morning like that and said, uh, okay, we're supposed to go as a church and we're going to march over in front of ISIS without any weapons or anything and we're just going to stand out there and watch a victory. Would you accept that as being from God? Okay, now, Jehoshaphat and his people did when... when uh, God spoke through the prophet uh, and said said to them, well, not the prophet, the priest then, spoke through the priest and said, it's my battle, not yours. March out of the gates in the morning singing praises and I'll give you, and you'll see the victory. I'll give you the victory. See, they had to trust God enough to accept his words to faith. Now, we know it was God speaking to them and everything because we read the scripture and it tells us it is. But how about in that group of people out here? This this guy, Hazi, stands up and says, God, thus saith the Lord. God said, it's my battle, not yours. In the morning, you all walk out of those gates, march out of those gates, singing praises. And you're standing there saying, hmm, in the morning now, i got to march out of those gates, singing praises in front of three armies that want to kill us? See, it was real to them. They had to decide, is that in their hearts, in their lives, is that really God speaking through him? And if it is God speaking through him, he, he wants us to walk out of those gates. Do we trust God enough to walk out of those gates singing praises and everything? See, that, there was a lot going on in their lives that it doesn't point out in those scriptures. It just says that, oh, when Jehaziel spoke up and said, uh, God, thus saith the Lord, God said, Is my battle not yours? March out of the gate singing praises. Jehoshaphat and all of them fell down on their faces just praising the Lord and, and thanking him for his answer and all this just immediately like that. They accepted as God speaking through his man Jehaziel and his words in. They praised him for his words. They praised him at the next morning. All they're going to have to do is go out and, and uh, sing praises and, you know, before the enemy. See? Faith is not something you just place here and place there. You've got to trust God enough to accept his words to teach that class, that you're qualified to teach that class. And if you're not qualified now, he's going to teach you and help you to teach that class. See, you don't place faith here and place faith there. So when you hear people talking about that, you know they don't know what they're talking about. Because faith is not something you have in your back pocket. You just take out and place here and here and here. You receive God's word into your heart to faith and in the work of his spirit in your heart the work of grace in from those words you receive into your heart the work of grace in gives you the strength to grow and become and do whatever it is God wants you to do see that's so confused in our society and everything well there are so many things being taught so wrong and everything and and like one of the main teachers of grace in our society, Max Licato, y'all, if you've listened to most of my uh, uh, podcasts or something like that, I've mentioned this before. In one of his recent books, he's had 25 or 30 books on grace, most of them in the New York Times bestseller list. And in one of his recent ones, about two years ago, something like that, a big, thick book and everything. But on page 10 of his book, all these words of grace, and oh, and he has about 15 or 20 of the top minister. Uh, ministers around our country in different, you know, uh, uh, denominations and, and operations and everything, like Franklin Graham and um, different people like that. 
have signed on it. How, how fantastic his book. Dr. Stanley says how fantastic this book is from Max Licato about grace. And he says it just it has just opened my eyes to new insights to grace and everything like this. You know, these 15 or 20 people just praising him in front of the book, you know, trying to tell us how great it is so we'll buy the book and everything. But on page 10 of his book, now this is page 10 of his book, he says, I have no tips on how to receive grace. It just gets you. He doesn't know how to share with anybody. He doesn't know how you get grace. And I've been sitting here now. It is so simple. You receive God's living words into your heart by faith. And like in, uh, what is it, Romans 5, 2. Uh, it, it tells us, in, um, well, what is it, Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's through faith, our acceptance and obedience to God's word, that we receive his living words into our heart for salvation. And it just goes on like that. Uh, for Romans 5 2 here it is by whom also we have access now see access by faith into this grace see because Jesus says in John 6 63 my words are spirit and they are life so when we accept and receive his words of spirit and life then into our heart those words of spirit and life in our heart perform the work of grace to create in us whatever it is God wants to create in us, you know, that he's speaking to us about. So, grace is the automatic response of us accepting God's word into our heart to faith. Now, if we reject God's word and don't allow his word to come into our heart, it's, it's like in Second um, Thessalonians 2, 10, 11. Apostle Paul says, people perish because they receive not the love of the truth, God's word, into their hearts. And certainly if we block God's love out and his words of, of salvation and everything out of our heart, we don't receive the salvation in. Like I read before, the only, what is it, uh, Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews 2, 4, where it says, you know, that the gospel preached to them did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. See, we block God's gospel gospel, the good news of his words, we block them from our heart, well, we certainly can't receive the changed heart then. We can't receive his love and his spirit and the work of grace in our heart if we if we refuse to receive his word into our heart by faith. Okay, so uh, anyway, as teachers, now, it doesn't take all his knowledge of faith and grace and this and how they're interrelated like that for a person become a child of God. All a person has to do is just call out and, and see themselves as a sinner and won't turn. They want to help. God help me. In fact, my wife was in a treatment center and she said about the second or third day in a treatment center, she just turned to God. Oh God, I want you. I want you more than anything. Oh God, help. You know, something like this. And the Lord responded. See, God hears a uh, broken heart. Let's see, what is it? Psalms 34, Psalms 34, 18, where it says, God heals a broken heart and saves a crushed in spirit. He saves a crushed in spirit. Now, if that person will turn to him, you know, something like that. But uh, we've got to turn to him with all our heart. Roman, let's see, in Jeremiah 29, 13, you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Now, there are so many more things here I'd like to share with you about the, the relationship of faith and grace, the automatic response of us receiving God's living words into our heart and that great work of grace that creates in us a new heart. We're in, uh, we become a child of God. We're now children of God. We're grafted into the family. We're born again. Jesus said, you must be born again. And that's what it is. We're born by the Spirit into the body of Christ. The Apostle Paul says in, let's see, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. By one Spirit are we all baptized into the body. See, we're baptized. We're cleansed. The new heart, the new life. He's created us a new heart, new life, and given us a new Spirit, put His Spirit in us. We're baptized, cleansed, and 
come into the body of Christ with that perfect clean heart and the Spirit of God and His love in us. And you'll know that when it happens. Oh, because all that other trash and all envy, jealousy, greed, hate, and things like that, they'll leave you. You'll look at people as different. People are, you know, God loves them. God wants everybody to become a child of God. And, and these Calvinistic teachings that, you know, God predestined people to heaven and predestined people to hell, that's of the devil too because he's trying to take away from what Jesus did on the cross. He's trying to, that takes away from even the need of Jesus doing it. And I, as I shared with you in some of the previous messages, but you may not have heard it, but in John 3.16 even, look at John 3.16. Well, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, let me read it just again. here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to suffer and die on the cross, to have the perfect walk of faith, to be persecuted, to suffer and all this, that whosoever has been predestined already go to heaven might go to heaven. See, that don't make sense. If people are predestined to heaven, there's no reason for Jesus to come down on the cross and like this. You know, see, the devil causes that teaching then to just make Jesus' effort in dying and suffering on the cross and uh, and setting up a way for people to be saved and receive the Spirit, living Spirit in the, their heart in the new covenant. See, that was unnecessary. If God is already going to, you know, decide ahead of time before people are born, who's going to die and go to heaven, who's going to die and go to hell? See, nothing that happens here on earth is going to change either one of those if it's predestined and elected, but it's not. See, that is such a lie to teach that because, see, the devil doesn't want people to know how important your choice is and that you must make the choice on where you're going. You've got to make reservations to say, yes, Lord, I want you. Come into my heart and save me. And I want to be with you throughout eternity. See, and Calvinism just teaches, well, it's already set. There's nothing you can do. Well, if there's nothing you can do, there wasn't any reason for Jesus to come down on the cross and go through all of his suffering and everything then. Because it's that's not going to change anybody, you know, whether they're predestined to heaven or hell, if God's already made the selection and everything. See, so that is ridiculous. But see, the devil has them teaching that and everything. And there's other scriptures where Jesus says in Matthew 25, 41, separating the sheep from the goats. You know, the goats being the bad people going to die and go off and go into hell and eternity, hell and lake of fire. So Jesus says to him, Depart from me, ye cursed, into eternal, everlasting fire created for the devil and his angels. See, the lake of fire and hell, they were only created for the devil and his angels, not people. See, nobody's ever been predestined to go to heaven or hell. We have to make the free will choice to receive him into our heart. Because, you know, if predestination or election were true, there was no need for Jesus in his work on the cross, his suffering, his dying. And see, the devil wants to do everything he can to, to tear Jesus down, tear what he did down, uh, and, and make it to no effect, you might say. And in doing that, he has all these things about, you know, grace is God's unmerited favor to confuse you. And then that, you know, that faith is, you know, uh, place your faith here and place your faith there like you have faith and you do this and you do this. See, it's giving you the control of that and everything. But faith comes from, yes, we have to make a choice. But, you know, we don't just place faith here and there because it doesn't work like that. We have to receive God's word to faith in obedience and everything. See, the devil's taking that out like that and turning it around backwards almost. Okay, so see, all these false teachings wind up just like Scripture said a while ago, like witchcraft, people failing to see and understand God's will for their life. And then uh, there's other people through our society that teach there's two graces, one grace for lost people and you know, one grace for you know the common people and then one grace for Christians. See, that shows total ignorance 
Now, there's a difference between stupidity and ignorance. I'm not saying they're stupid. I'm saying they're ignorant. They just do not know. But people that teach two graces, because see, grace is the work of the Spirit in the heart. So when we uh, ask the Lord to forgive us of our sins and invite Him to come into our heart, that's the work of grace in that changes a person from being a lost person to a child of God. And Romans 8 9 says, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. See, the instant the Spirit of Christ comes into a person's heart and starts working that work of grace, they are a child of God. See, so you can't have a, a grace to common people that are lost people outside of them immediately then becoming a child of God. See, so it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't work. But now, we're not going to be able to change the world. I wish we could and everything like this. But for those of you listening, please listen to my podcast on faith and grace. More of me like that. Because I've got uh, 60, 70, 80 podcasts. And I give the announcements about it like that. Listen to them. And get this cleared up in your mind. Because when we're sharing with people, we need to share with them, you know, like that, that all you have to do is just with all your heart cry out, God, please forgive me. Come into my heart and save me. Now, he forgives our sins. When it when the scripture says that we're born total sin, what it means is we're born it, with our hearts totally separated from God. As children, as babes, you know, we're born by moms and dads of the flesh. Now, as we start growing older, God starts teaching us and trying to, you know, draw us to him, you know, through his mercy and through his, you know, unmerited favor, you know, drawing us to him and everything, making his presence on. And then... He now wants us then to come to him and say, oh, yes, Lord, I, I want to receive more of your love. And see, and that's what it is. He blesses lost people so that we'll want more of his love and then we'll turn to him and say, God, I want all of your love. I want your love in me. See, and that's his purpose, you know, blessing lost people, drawing repentance. He doesn't beat people up to try to make them come to him. No, these people hear his testimony and say, God got me flat on my back, and he just took this from me, and he took this from me, and he just made me so sick, and he just did all this so I would turn to him. No, the devil did that to you. God doesn't beat people up like that to try to teach them something. That is so ridiculous. See, that's the devil there got people people trying to blame God for all those hurts and everything that he did to them because like for example you say well how was it God doing it to me I've never you know I mean how was it the devil doing it to me well 2 Corinthians 2 10 11 gives you a clue it says forgive others lest you give Satan advantage in your life and I doubt if there's anybody out there listening right now has not held unforgiveness to some people and many of you might be holding unforgiveness now and if you are holding unforgiveness. I don't care who you are. If you're a preacher who's been preaching 30, 40 years, I don't care if you're the Pope. I don't care who you are. If you're holding unforgiveness, your heart is open for the devil to come in and torment you. Your, I mean, your life, not your heart. Whatever, anyway. But it says you're giving Satan advantage in your life, and he has the authority then the right to come in because you're out of fellowship with God. And when you're out of fellowship with God holding unforgiveness, the devil has advantage and control in your life. I don't care how good you are in going to church or your, all these other things, how sweet you are or something like that, the devil has control. And also like in Ephesians 4, 26, 27, be angry, sin not, let not the sun go down your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. See, you're giving place to the devil if you're holding anger and bitterness. And it says over in Hebrews that don't let that root of bitterness, you know, come in and, you know, many will be affected. Many will be affected in your life if you have a root of bitterness in any way about illegals, about, you know, uh, um, drug runners, about all these other different things in our society going on like this. Those things are important in your heart. You've got to get your heart right with God or the devil's going to have advantage in your life. I don't care how good a Christian you supposedly are. And see, that's what's real. It's our heart in relationship with God in our life personally and it makes a big difference first peter 3 7 husband dwell your wives according to knowledge be enjoying heirs of grace life lest your prayers be hindered anything you do to hinder your prayers you're giving satan advantage in your life and and there's hospitals all across our nation right now 
that's got so many Christians in them because of unforgiveness, because of root of bitterness, because of, you know, envy, jealousy, and greed. They're, and, you know, when, when you're envious of somebody, you're accusing God of neglecting you and not giving you your rightful portion. See, you're, you're attacking God by your envy and you know, jealousy and things like this, you know. So we can get saved and help people get saved by telling them to turn their hearts and life to the Lord and somebody just well what is it Second Corinthians chapter 3 verse 16 says when the heart of man when it turns to the Lord the veil of separation is lifted see so God hears heart language if a person will just turn and cry out oh God forgive me come into my heart but for you and I for us as Christians trying to share his word we need to know these relationships. We need to know about faith, know about grace, because it's in the Scripture. And when we tell people to read the Bible, we need to help them understand that faith comes by hearing and receiving and accepting and obeying God's Word when we hear it. Mercy is God's love on and to people and His Word to them. Grace is always the work of His Spirit into our heart that we receive His living words when we accept His living words by faith into our heart. The automatic result then is when those living words come into our heart, they start performing a work of grace to help us grow, to help us do that. See, we, these relationships like this that people are going to be reading in the Bible, we need to help them understand them so we don't need to be teaching there's two graces. The grace is God's unmerited favor. No. Romans 4.2 or two four, excuse me, is is the unmerited favor is for people out of fellowship with God. God is blessing them, drawing them to try to get back in fellowship for those of us Christians. But for lost people, He's trying to draw them. And see, we are ambassadors for Christ. We're supposed to be teaching and preaching God's word accurately. Now, you don't have to know all these theological words to get saved, but we are responsible as children of God to learn them and learn them correctly and learn his word and share his word correctly and that's why I, I, I harp on this in Proverbs 30 5 and 6 every word of God is pure a shield and put their trust in him add thou not to it lest he reprove thee and thou be found a liar you go out and start sharing with lost people a bunch of these mixed up confused relationships and everything and God's not going to back up anything you shared to him just fill with you know untruth God's unmerited favor and you place your faith here and do this and do that you know we need to be sharing the truth God's pure word if you're going to spend your time doing it try to do it accurately and as correct as you can because ambassadors are not allowed to change the message of the person that's sending you the king that sends the ambassador out the ambassador is not allowed to change that the king won't back it up and the king sends us out to share his love and his words of reconciliation and everything and the good news of the gospel. But when we mix all this confusion and stuff in it and everything like that, he's not going to back up what we're sharing. And that's what's wrong in our society. If people knew and understood the joy of the changed heart, the changed life that took place in my heart, and if, if, if they knew what they were missing you know, like that, That's what the world needs to know. The world needs to know about the changed heart, the changed life, Christ in us, and the great change it makes in a person. And that's what we should each be seeking to do every day in our life. Good day, and God bless you. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. Each of my programs are being saved so that you can listen to them at any time. There's just four simple steps to find the past programs. Go to www.spreaker.com. That's S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com. Enter my name, Richard Harden, in the search box in the top center of the home page. 
Click on the brown icon, which has the Bible, two candlesticks, and a cross in the background. A list of my programs will come up. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. 